Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. John, chapter 4. And begin reading at the first verse, and then read down through verse 26. John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. John chapter 4, verse 1, John writes, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, <coughs> near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me a drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy me. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou... Being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of me him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that says thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We worship, I'm sorry, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will teach us all things. Then saith, uh, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now I call your attention particularly to that 24th verse, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Many times in these verses we've just read, you read the word worship. Many times people get together on Sunday morning in a place very similar to this one, and they say, I'm going to worship. That's all wonderful, that's good. But what is worship? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time that we have together. Lord, it is my prayer that you would help us not only to understand what worship is, but to indeed worship you. And Lord, forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your moving and working in our midst. Lord, I pray again that you touch every heart here according to their need. And if there's a single soul here who does not already know you, then it's my prayer that one would open their heart and trust you and come into a true 
relationship of worship with you this hour. Now, Father, we commit this time to these people and this your work in Jesus' name. Amen. We just sang some hymns. I ask you to pay close attention to the words. Well, the last hymn that we sang together, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. That is a great old hymn. In the Sunday school hour, I was mentioning what is one of my all time favorite uh, films or movies, if not my very favorite. And it's called Sheppy. It was made, I think, in the late 1970s by Bob Jones University. And it is based on a true story about a circuit riding preacher in the 1800s. Uh, story ends in the early 1900s, uh, named Robert Sheppy. This tremendous movie. And part of the theme music for that movie is that song, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Now that's wonderful. And we have, brethren, met to worship this morning, but what is worship? I was talking uh, some time ago to a young man, very handsome young man, very personable young man, and I think a very sincere young man. I, I want to be clear about that. And uh, I asked him what he did. And he said that he was the worship leader at a certain church, not far from here. And uh, I thought that was interesting. So I asked him, I said, now, when you say worship leader, is that more or less what we used to call a song leader? He said, yeah, that's pretty much the same idea. Not exactly, but pretty much the same idea. So I thought about that for a minute while we were talking. I said, well, let me ask you a question. You, uh, you kind of get everybody singing, and, and, and you kind of head up the, the congregational singing and all that. Yeah. I said, but by you being designated not a song leader, but a worship leader, are you saying that we are only worshiping when we're singing? And he said, yes. I thought about that for a moment. Now, I, hear me. I don't know that everybody who calls himself a worship leader, every church that has someone called a worship leader would say the same thing. I don't know they'd all answer that question the same way, but that's the way he answered. So his answer was yes, we are only worshiping when we're singing. Now, let me share something with you. I believe that music is a part of worship. It's very biblical to have music in worship. In Solomon's temple, there was a choir and there were instruments of music. David wrote psalms to be played on instruments of music and all of the psalms were written to be sung. In the New Testament, we find evidence of people singing and praising God and in two different books, Colossians and then again in Ephesians, Paul says we are to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're to praise God and to worship God. So music is a very important part of worship, and I'm, I'm not trying to diminish that. Please don't misunderstand me. What I am saying is that I think worship is more than that. Worship is, includes music or can include music. Actually, it doesn't have to include music. But music is a very definite part of it. I want to say something else here, and then we'll, we'll move on from the music aspect of this. I realize that our church is, in many ways, somewhat old-fashioned. Can I share with you something? That's not because we aren't aware that there are people who do things differently. We're very aware that people do things differently, and we're not here to condemn everybody who doesn't do things exactly the way we do. That's, that's not the point. Never has been, never shall be. But we do things the way we do because not just because we're old-fashioned, no, no, you're Baptist, you're traditionalist, you never change anything, that's not it. That's not it. We do things the way we do them because we believe it's the right way to do it. What do you mean by the right way to do it? Well, everything we do here, we do on purpose. We don't do anything just to be doing it. We don't sing songs as well. I guess we ought to sing some songs. Oh, what are we going to say? That doesn't say, let's, let's pick something real quick. Don't do it that. We do it all on purpose. I, I think I may have shared this here before, but not recently. I don't do the special music. I usually don't know any sooner than you do who is going to do special music here. I find that out pretty much about when it happens. 
Uh, I saw the song up here this morning, uh, the music for it. I didn't know who was going to sing it. You know, Brother Claude said he was going to sing it. So that's that's good. That's wonderful. I don't do that. Brother Claude's in charge of special music. I don't know what the choir is going to sing. Now the choir does. They they rehearse. They rehearse every week. Uh, actually, a couple of times a week they rehearse. But I never know what they're going to sing usually until they sing it. Now, once in a while, about once a year or so, I request that they sing a song, but not very often. But when it comes to and, and the offertory and the prelude music that's played, that's all up to Brother Chris or whoever happens to be playing the piano. Not always him. I was thinking as he was playing this morning, uh, one of our former pianists we've had here. Over the years, we've had a lot of pianists here, <laughs> quite a few. But uh, one of our former pianists here, we had a visiting preacher here one day, and uh, he said to me after service, he said, I think you're going to wear your pianist out. You got him playing so much. And I think he may be right about that. But Brother Chris chooses what operatory he's going to play, what prelude music he'll play, and so forth. But when it comes to congregational singing, the hymns that we sing, I pick those out. Why do you do that? Are you a great musician? I'm not a great anything. To tell you the truth, I do a lot of things, but I'm not really great at anything. Mm -hmm. But the fact of that is, I choose them not because I think I know more about music than anybody else here, or certainly don't know more than Johnson Claude knows. He's got a degree in music. I took a class or two that I didn't do very well in music. <laughs> so I am not. Uh, plenty to know more about music than he does about a long shot. But I know what I'm preaching. And so the hymns that we sing go along with the message. They have the same theme that the message has. Well, I don't know if I picked up on that. Well, that's why I tell you to pay attention to words. All the hymns we sing today are worship hymns. And what do we talk about? Worship. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how to make that any clearer than brethren we have met to worship. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> all right. So they were all worship hymns. So it's all done on purpose, and it's all done to center your thinking around God and his word and the message that he has for us. So let's look at that message this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. John chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, when therefore the Lord knew how that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Now, why does John even tell us that? Why does that matter? Why is it important? Well, first of all, who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were a particular religious group. They were the predominant religious group in Israel at that time. They weren't the only one by any means, but they were the largest, most powerful religious group at that time and they were very very strict in keeping the law they were also and even more so i should say very strict in keeping their traditions they actually held their traditions above the scriptures which was a major <laughs> point of conflict between them and the lord jesus and the pharisees opposed jesus they knew that he was presenting himself as the messiah the savior and they they weren't having it now, when I say they weren't happy, I am speaking in generalities because actually some of them became believers. But as a group, they weren't going to have it. And they heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. To which you might say, okay, so what? Well, here's the so what. John, referring to John the Baptist, not John the Apostle who's writing this, John the Baptist was extremely popular with people. I mean, they liked him. How much did they like him? Whenever John the Baptist came along the scene and he began to speak, thousands of people would go to listen to him. And many, many people would come, and many, many people would be baptized by him. And the truth of the matter is, John the Baptist is probably the most famous person in history when it comes to baptizing people. I, I think that's safe to say. But it says... Jesus made him baptize more disciples than John. Now, the Pharisees didn't much like John simply because he wasn't one of them. 
and he preached against the fact that they elevated tradition above scripture. So they didn't much like John. <clears throat> but they wouldn't do anything against John because he was so very popular. Does that sound a little political to you? It should, because it is. So they, they, they wouldn't do anything against John because he was, he was immensely popular and they didn't want to go against the flow of popularity. They wanted to be popular. But now Jesus, who they really don't like, he's got more disciples and he's baptized more than John. They're going to see that as a problem. Because John, we can tolerate. Don't like him, but we can tolerate. Jesus, he's getting too popular. Too many people, and we really don't go along with him. Okay. John adds a very important note in verse 2. <coughs> so Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So Jesus wasn't doing the baptism. Who was doing the disciples, Peter, James, John, James the less, the rest of them, they were all doing the baptism. Thomas, no doubt, Matthew. So why does John make a point of telling us this? Well, there could be more than one reason, but I think one of the reasons is this. God is wiser than we are. And God knows that we're what we're going to do in the future before we know. And God knew that in the future after this time, there were people who were going to come along and teach and, and command, really, that before a person could be saved, as a, an essential part of their salvation, can't be left out. You had to be baptized. And yet, Jesus is the Savior, and John makes the point of telling us here that Jesus didn't baptize. Now, if, if Jesus is the Savior, and you have to be baptized to be saved, wouldn't you think Jesus would have baptized? What do you think? Does that make sense? You know, in, in Paul's writings, Paul comes along and he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except that he names three or four people that he baptized. He's writing 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says in that same passage, Christ, listen, he said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Paul draws a dark line of separation between baptism and the gospel. Christ didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. And later in that same book, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 15, he defines the gospel. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and where you stand, by which also you're saved. Do you hear that? You're saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's it. That's the gospel, by which you are saved, according to the Apostle Paul. And what is the gospel? Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day. I didn't hear the word baptism in there, did you? No. You didn't hear it because it isn't there. If you'll go back and read it, you'll still not find it. So Paul delineates very clearly, again, between the baptism and the gospel. Are you saying, preacher, that we shouldn't be baptized? I'm not saying that at all. Are you saying that it's, it's not something that we ought to do? I'm not saying that either. What I'm saying is it is not a part of your soul's salvation. It doesn't save you. It doesn't help to save you. Let me give you one more thought on that and we'll move on. Do you remember the story of Jesus when he was crucified? And he wasn't crucified alone. There were with him two who? Thieves. Thank you. Two thieves crucified with him. And at first they began to mock him. But after a while, one of them gets to think about it. He said, hey, this man is dying. We're dying. Uh, maybe this isn't the time to be mocking him. Mm -hmm. So he turns to the other fellow and he says, maybe, maybe we shouldn't mock him. He looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to this man, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. 
What do you mean by that? Well, they were both dying. But he says, this same day, you're going to be with me in heaven. So how's he going to get there? So let me ask you a logical question. That sounds a little silly, but let's just, just stay with me. Do you suppose that that thief, when Jesus said, he said, remember me, you come in the kingdom. Jesus said, this day, you shall thou be with me in paradise. You suppose he hopped down off that cross and really got baptized? <laughs> no. Not a chance. Not a chance in the universe. He might have wanted to do that, but he couldn't. Wasn't possible. And yet Jesus said, this day, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, let me ask you another question. That fellow was on the cross, what? He said to his friend, he says, we're here justly. This is the just reward of our deeds. You and I are guilty of crime. Yes, we're being crucified, but we're guilty. This man hasn't done anything wrong, speaking of Jesus. Now, he knew he was dying. And he did die that very day. He knew that was going to happen. Everybody there knew that was going to happen. So not only did he call on Jesus and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Listen, do you think that guy went out and did a lot of good things in order to please God and make God happy so that he would accept him into heaven? No. Well, certainly not. But what opportunity would he have had to do that? You know what the one thing he did was? He called on Jesus in faith. That's what he did. You know what the Bible says about that? Romans 10, 17. Check it out for yourself. I'm sorry, 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he did. He called on the Lord and he was saved. Can it be that simple? It not only can be, it is. Take a look at verse 3. Because the Pharisees heard this, Jesus left Judea. Now that's the area surrounding Jerusalem. Jesus left Judea and departed again into Galilee. That was where he had grown up. The next verse, verse 4, is interesting. It says he must needs go through Samaria. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you and keep it in mind because it's going to come back in a couple of verses here. Way back. In the Old Testament times, hundreds of years before Jesus walked this earth, in the days of the kings of Israel, King Saul is the first king of Israel. He passes away, and David becomes king of Israel. But in the beginning, he's not king over the whole country. Some of the people didn't follow him at first. After a while, they did, and so eventually he unites the country. His son Solomon becomes king, and Israel, 12 tribes of Israel, all one united country under King Solomon. Solomon passes off the scene, and his son Rehoboam becomes king. Rehoboam was a particularly tough king, harsh king, and there was a division and a rebellion, and ten of the twelve tribes of Israel left the kingdom. They would not be under the reign of King Rehoboam. They chose another fellow named Jeroboam, no relation, similar sounding name, but no relation, Jeroboam to be their king, and they called their ten tribes, which were in the north, Israel. And the two remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were called Judah. Why didn't it, wasn't it Judah, Benjamin? Because well, Benjamin was kind of small. So it was called Judah. And that's the region of Jerusalem. So you had this divided kingdom. Centuries go by, and the Assyrians attack the northern kingdom. They attack Israel. And they conquer it, but they say there's too many people to carry them all back to Assyria, so they assimilated with them. And they created a new country. And that new country came to be called Samaria. And the people who lived there were part Israeli and part Assyrian. Now, many of them were still Israeli in their heart, mind, and thoughts, and in their belief. But there was major division. There was actually over the years even war between the northern kingdom, Israel, which later came to be called Samaria, and Judah. You with me so far? By the time Jesus comes on the scene, there's no war 
between Samaria and Judah. But they don't get along with each other. They do not like each other. The people of Judah look at the people of Samaria and say, and forgive me for using this term, this is really what they thought. Those half-breeds, they're not real Israelis. They're just part Israeli. And the people of Samaria thought, looked at the people of Judah, and they said, those snobs, they're not very good. They pretend to be more righteous than we are, but they're not. They're at least as sinful as we are, not more. And they, they hated each other. Now, remember a minute ago, I talked about the Pharisees. I said, does that sound like politics to you? And I said, it is. Remember that? Well, this thing that I just described to you, does that sound like racism to you? Well, it kind of is. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, we're just going to tell it like it is. So they, did, they hated each other. But Galilee, which is in the north of the country, belonged to Judah in the south. And in between Galilee, where Jesus grew up, and Judah, where Jerusalem is, sits Samaria. And the shortest way to get from Judea up to Galilee is to go through Samaria. But most people wouldn't do it. Why? They didn't want to come in contact with a Samaritan. That's why you hear the parable of the good Samaritan. The big deal. A Samaritan was good. Wow, they did something good. We don't like Samaritan, but this Samaritan did something good. That's why you hear about the good Samaritan. So what would they do? Instead of going up through Samaria, which was the straightest route, if they had to go to Galilee or travel to and from Galilee, they would go up the east side and go through the mountains of, of Syria. Just to get there, it was a much harder trip. It took much longer to get there, but at least they didn't have to come in contact with those people. You got the picture? Now I want you to look at something here. Verse 4. It says, He, Jesus, must needs go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. Why did he need to go through Samaria? There was another way to get to Galilee. It was the way most people took. It was the way the trade routes went. Why did he need to go through Samaria? I'll tell you why. Because he had business to take care of in Samaria. That's why. Take a look at it. Verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. That's interesting by itself, because Jacob would have dug that well more than a thousand years prior to this. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. Now that tells us something very important about Jesus. You know what it tells us? He got tired. Wait a minute, preacher. You've said many times here. I, I've heard you say it. You can't deny it. Jesus was God. Guilty. I have said that many times. And you know what? I'm going to keep on saying it because it's true. Well, if he's God, how can he be tired because he was in a human body? Listen to what Hebrews says about that. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, it tells us that he, Jesus, was at all points tempted like as we are. You know what that means? It means he felt the same things you and I feel. Did he get hungry? He got hungry. Did he get thirsty? He got thirsty. Did he get tired? He got tired. Did he rest and sleep? He rested and slept. He felt all the things that you feel. Did he feel pain? He felt pain. He did that so that he, you would know that he knows what you know. That he has experienced what you experienced. So he was tired. He was weary. He sat on the edge of the well. And in verse 6 again, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour, late in the day. There cometh a woman of Samaria <clears throat> to draw water. Nothing unusual about that. It's getting late today. This lady's coming to get water, probably to prepare the evening meal or who knows what, but that's a pretty good assumption. And so she, she comes to get water out of the well. They didn't have running plumbing in, in that area. They did have that in the ancient world, but they didn't have it in that area. Well, how do you know? Because if they had, she wouldn't have been coming to the well to get water. That's why. 
All right, so she comes to get water. And in verse 7 again, there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Why did he ask her? Tells us, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me? Which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Was she ever right about that? I can't believe that you, a Jewish man, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, anything. I can't believe that you're asking me for a drink of water. The Jewish people, and especially the Jewish men, they don't have anything to do with Samaritans, especially a Samaritan woman. You know what? Jesus did. Jesus did. And that's a very, very important part of this story, but it's a very, very important part of understanding who Jesus is. Very quickly. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep from whence hast thou, then hast thou that food. Why are you going to give me water? You just asked me for water. Now you say you could give me water if I ask you. You don't even have a bucket. Then she goes on, verse 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof of himself, and his children, and his cattle? Now, Jesus gave her a different answer. And when she said, are you greater than Jacob? He could have said, well, as a matter of fact, now that you mentioned your name. But he didn't say that. What did he say? Verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this well shall thirst again. It's just water. If you drink this, it will help you for a while, but you will get thirsty again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into, watch the phrase, everlasting life. The woman will say that then, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. If you got water that I can drink and never thirst again, I want some of that. Well, who wouldn't? It's not exactly on the same page. So, when she says that, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that says thou truth. Now stop right there. Here's what I'll strike you about that. How do you know that? Had he met this woman before? Had other people been around gossiping to him, telling him about her? No. Well, how do you know that? Well, he just got in the area. Well, maybe his disciples knew it. Not likely. Remember what said earlier? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That's not likely. How do you know that? Well, you know, does that idea strike you? Because it struck this woman. How do you know it did? Well, look. Verse 19, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art, you must be a prophet. If you know that about me, we've never met before, you haven't talked to anybody, you know that about me, you must be a prophet. And yes, he did know about her. Just like he knows about you and I. So then, when she realizes that this strange man she's talking to is a prophet, she gets very religious. You know, I, I've, I've noticed that about people. They'll do that. They find out you're a preacher. They, they'll either get away from you as fast as they can, or they'll get real religious. Usually it goes something like this. Well, you know what I believe? And then the door's open for whatever comes next, and it may be anything. Hmm. So you just, what do you do? You stand there or sit and you listen. Hear what they have to say. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not so great. <laughs> But the truth is, you listen. Because it's important to understand what people believe and where they're coming from and what's in their heart and in their mind.
So she says in verse 20, our fathers, and here's, here's the first time this word is used. Notice how many times it's used. This is one. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and they did. They had an altar there. And ye, being Jewish, ye say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship as two times. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Three times in this passage. 22, ye worship, ye know not what, four times. We know what we worship, five times, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers, six, shall worship seven, the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now we're up to eight times. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him, nine, must worship him, ten, in spirit and in truth. Can I share something with you? If God says something once, it's important. If God says something ten times in the passage, he's trying to get something across to us. You know, you're supposed to take notice. What is Jesus talking to this woman about? Worship. You know, preacher, you said you're going to talk about what is worship. You haven't answered that question yet. You're right, I haven't. We're getting there. And we don't have much time, so, so stay with me. <laughs> Jesus talks to her all about worship. And notice the important thing that he says in verses 23 and 24. He says, but the hour cometh now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Number one, what is worship? It is spiritual. It is not just mental, it is spiritual. And it has to be offered in truth. In spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Did you know God is in truth? He is. He may be seeking you this morning. Over and over and over, God says, Come to me. Come. We're going to look at that tonight. Isaiah chapter 1, he says, Come unto me. Come. Come now, let us read together. For we sin to be a scarf, they shall be as wool. Over and over, Jesus said, Come and be all you that labor and heavy laden. Revelation says, The Spirit of God will say, Come. Let him that is the thirst come. Whosoever will, let him come. Drink of the water of life free. The same water of life he was talking about to this lady. So the Father is seeking, calling people to come. Why is that? Verse 24, for God is a spirit. Stop right there. If you're going to worship God, you must worship God spiritually, in spirit. Now, there's different kinds of spirit. And I'm going to get loud, and I don't get loud very often. Matter of fact, people always tell me, I can't hear you. Which I want to say, turn up your ear you. But anyway, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, uh, I'm going to get loud. So I'm just telling you that because I don't get loud. And everybody says, I don't like it when you get loud. And you get loud. <laughs> there's one kind of spirit. Like if you go to watch the dolphins play. And they're winning. You go, <laughs> <laughs> I warned you. I warned you. Now, that is a spirit, right? Is that spirit? Or maybe you say, go heat, or what? Whatever. Sport or team, or okay? That's spirit, right? That's not the kind of spirit he's talking about. Here. No. That's what we call team spirit. And that's great. Nothing wrong with that. The spirit is talking about here is this. The spirit that God placed within every human being. That part of you that is literally made in the image of God. That part of you which can commune with God. That's the spirit he's talking about. And in your spirit, which you have, you have a spirit. A lot I've never seen on spirit. Well, I haven't seen your spirit either. No offense, but I don't really want to. <laughs> That'd be kind of strange. But the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of things that you have that you've never seen. Well, like 
what, for example? Well, like you've never seen your, your thoughts that you have them. You've never seen sound that you hear it. We could go on and on with that, but I think you got the idea. A lot of things you haven't seen that you know are real and they exist. So you have a spirit, and God wants you to worship him in his spirit and in truth. In knowledge of the truth, that you know what the truth is. What is the truth? Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate looked him in the face and said, what is truth? What an ironic question to ask Jesus. Who, not long before that, had proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. goes on to say, when he says, no man can follow but by me, right below that, John chapter 14, Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father that suffice with us. You're the way to the Father, show us the Father. I want to see God. And Jesus said, have I been so long time with you, and yet has thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Wow. What a statement. So you worship him in spirit, you worship him in truth. And in truth means you've got to worship him through the truth that is Jesus Christ. So 25, the woman's catching on. She said, verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah coming. She's right. She knew the Messiah was coming. Been promised since the Garden of Eden that a Messiah would come, a Savior. I know that Messiah coming, which is called Christ, the Greek form of Mashiach, the Hebrew, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Well, she was right about that. She was right. The Messiah was coming. When the Messiah was coming, he would tell them all things. They would know then what the truth was. They would know then who was right. The Samaritans right, the Jews right, who's right. They would know that. They would know the truth. I heard somebody say this on the radio recently, and uh, I heard this same person say it several times. And I don't mean just the last few days. I've heard him say it several times over the last few months. And I, I don't know if the quote is original with this person that I heard say it or if they got it from somebody else. I, I really don't know. They may have gotten it from someone else. But nonetheless, the quote makes sense. The person said this, and, and, and think about this. He said, there are two sides to every story, but there's only one set of facts. Mm -hmm. You think about that. You know what he's saying? He's saying there can be two sides to every story, but there's only one truth. Huh. I was talking with a lady some years ago, and we were talking theology. And um, she said, her viewpoint was quite different than mine. And she was trying to persuade me, I was trying to persuade her, and neither one of us was winning. So I thought to myself, this is not going anywhere. So I just stopped. I said, you know what, I'm going to stop. I said, but let me share something with you. I says, you and I can't both be right. She said, that's right. I said, that means one of us is wrong. She says, yes. I said, dead wrong. And she stopped and thought a minute, and she said, I see what you mean. But there can be two sides to the story. There's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. They that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? Because God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, I am the Messiah. Listen to me. Worship is what? Number one, worship is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not what you think it is. It's not some kind of paranoia when you go through life worried that God's going to get you. That's not it. It's not it at all. Fear of the Lord, as it's mentioned in the Bible, is recognizing the holiness of God, the majesty of God, and the authority of God. Worship is the fear of the Lord. Secondly, worship is recognizing the love of God. Yes, God is holy, and he is majestic, and he has all authority, but he is loving and he cares about you. 
Well, I don't know this. God in the Old Testament, he, you know, always. Uh, you know what God says in Ezekiel chapter 33? Listen. He said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You hear that? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Check it out. Ezekiel chapter 33. Worship is recognizing the love of God. Worship is gratitude to God for what he has done for you. Worship is living a life of service to God. That's what worship is. Now, can you worship when you're singing? You certainly can. And you should. Is every song in the world a worship song? No, it is. I, I heard a guy on the video the other day. He said, all oh, music is worship music. I said, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think <laughs> Can't really agree with that. <coughs> he went on, he said, Well, it's whatever you're singing about, that's what you're worshiping. There was a song, a popular song I like many years ago called Does the Chewing Gun Lose Flavor on the Bed Post Overnight. That doesn't sound like worshiping anything to me. <laughs> Another one that I like, you can't roller skate the buffalo herd. I, I don't <laughs> see any worship for Paul about that. I think it's a funny song, but I just don't see where that worships anything. It doesn't. My point is this. Can you worship by singing? Absolutely. And you should. You should. Is music a part of worship? Yes. And a good part, a vital part. But it's not all of it. Our worship must go way beyond that. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the time that we've had together. Lord, forgive us anything that would stand in the way of our worship in you. Lord, it's my prayer that each and every person here would enter into an attitude, a spiritual attitude of worship in you. Knowing that you are holy and that we are not. Knowing that you are majestic and we are not. Knowing that you have all authority and we do not. But knowing that you love us. God so loved the world, the people of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. That whosoever believes in him, trusts him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Well, preacher, that's that's all good and fine, but I know I know the Lord is my Savior. I know that heaven's my eternal home. I know my sins are forgiven. Thank God. That's wonderful. But if you're here, if anybody's here, you have even a shadow of a doubt about that. You say, Well, that sounds good to me, and I like that. I'm not 100 percent sure about all of it. Let me invite you. We're going to sing a hymn in a moment. If you would walk down front and meet me there, I would be glad to share with you from the Bible what God has to say. We're not going to hold you up in front of everybody. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. We're not going to put you through any ritual. You're not signing anything or joining anything. We'll just take the Bible and take a couple of minutes to show you what it has to say about knowing that your sins are forgiven, your soul is saved, you're on your way to heaven. It's not talking about joining this church. It's Talking about putting your faith and trust in the one who loves you and gave himself for you, Jesus Christ. What's that plain stuff? Maybe you're here this morning and say, Well, I, I, I have questions about that's fine. Be glad to take the time to talk to you. Perhaps there's somebody here today who's a preacher on saved, no doubt about it. If I needed to, I could tell you the time, I could show you the place where I was saved. Isn't that great? Perhaps God's speaking to you about something. Maybe the subject of worship, or maybe something else that I've not talked about, but He's been talking to you, and you know it. You need to do business with Him, let Him do business with you. You come by this. Father, bless and move this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're singing this morning, hymn number 204.